people of Earth, attention! This is the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Welcome aboard the Chronosphere, it's Chronosphere Fiction, and I'm your pilot, Daniel French. The COVID blight has managed to slow down a bit of our travels through the spectral streams, but due to your encouragement and emails, I have re-emerged and am ready to catch up for you all, which means it's time to travel into the bubbleverse of Gafgarn, the Eternally Unfurnished, or Season 2, Episode 1, our 16th episode of Gafgarn, entitled Taking a Moment. We're trying out a new voice actor in this one, and voice of Aleda is Madalena Fossetti. Welcome to the Chronosphere Fiction family, Madalena. Keep your eye on the Chronosphere feed because, as you know, there are a lot of scheduled flights that are behind that are about to be released. And now, Gafgarn, the Eternally Unfurnished, Season 2, Episode 1, Taking a Moment. Gafgarn awoke with a start, sweat like beads of ice all over his body. It was the same every night before, since the terrible pit of darkness swallowed everyone in Ursula's mansion hole and spit them back out, chewed, gnawed, and missing pieces of themselves. Though he was spared the physical mastication, the nightmares were chilling, blurry recollection of whatever lurked beyond, a plague on his mind and soul. He wiped the sweat from his brow with a rag he kept in the tent. With such frantic force, he hoped the shapes in the dark might wash away as well. In waking hours, none appeared clear in his memory. Only vague shadows within shadows. Being unable to recall the dark things was as maddening as their haunting his dreams. But he wondered how better he'd fare if the picture were clear. Through his tent flap, he eyed the early morning light and resolved to leave the dark things behind. Donning a clean shirt and his woven cloak, he stepped out into the frigid morning. Around him lay an expansive yard of struggling, stringy grass, and hedgerows stood in various degrees of overgrowth or decay. The tree below which he rested, an ancient oak, remained strong and healthy, though its yellowing leaves warned of an approaching bareness. <laughs> Percy, with his horse, huffed from the stable nearby, where the overstocked carriage sat along a poorly kept cobbled driveway, plants everywhere threatening to overtake the path. Next to the stable, was a plain, unattended blacksmithy, tools hanging about, unused around the dead bellows within an unsturdy wooden frame. But for the horse, Gafgarn was alone, a condition he silently thanked as the questions from the group annoyed him. He knew he couldn't avoid the coming discussion any longer, not if his work were to be done. He sorely needed some answers himself. Letting his cloak play in the comfortable chill, he made his way to the formidable building before him. Like a tower at its center, it stretched out on either side and two wings ending in tall turrets. Untamed vines grappled with the sturdy building's stone and timber, its long green fingers digging into even the windows. It reminded Gafgarn of the holds and longhouses back home. Wild, strong, ancient, as much a part of the mountains as the trees and stone. It also reminded him of something dark and unfamiliar, creeping into his heart from that space in his nightmares. Not that what he was stepping into was any better. Following his heavy footfalls up stone stairs were Rogni's eyes above a self-satisfied smile. He scratched his beard and stretched on the lengthy porch. Nice of you to visit. You finally ready to go home? No. Figures. 
You make some strange noises in your sleep. Talk about that, maybe? No. Right. Well, you should know it's going around. This group you've got with you, I don't know why, but they're still here even though they're spooked. No one can even give me a clear picture of that night. You really don't want to talk about it? No. Gafgarn, come on, it's me. You really won't... <clears throat> Stop asking. I don't know, Rodney. I don't know anything. Ah, strange to hear from you. Disappointing that. Still, I'm glad to see you among the living. If you can call your new friends such. <clears throat> Bad? I don't know much about Westerners, except they're barely worth a fight. These ones, though. Something serious ails them. Same as you. What have they said? Mostly nothing. They tend to themselves or each other. Everyone's got their own wounds, inside and out. Sully's told me everything she could, though. Talkative one, that. Mm. And what did you tell them? No more than at the campground. We didn't exile you. This is your doing. The rest, like why, is your tale to tell, I believe. Not that I completely understand this business. Why tell them anything? The truth will grant you freedom, old friend. I was hoping to convince you to come back home. Maybe that they'd help me. Your people need you. What you built will crumble without you. This pit stain thing, the magic girl, maybe it complicates things. Maybe it's better we leave it alone. I left for answers. I won't go back without them. Rodney shrugged. Yeah, we won't get any standing out here then. He motioned with his hand to enter, and with a huff, Gafgarn led the way. Inside was a bare estate covered in thick dust. Cobwebs inhabited every corner. A large central hall stretched out into each wing, doors of ornate carvings trailing down its wood and stone walls. Though dusty, Gafgarn took comfort in the earthy design. With Rogni in tow, he made his way past a poorly outfitted storeroom and dusty kitchen into the main hallway proper, turning left into the west wing. At the end rested a large set of doors carved with a scene of a forest, complete with a grand elk standing guard amongst his does. Afgarn pulled the doors open to reveal the inside of a tower, its round walls lined with filled bookcases up three floors. Wither sat in a wide circular table, expertly made from the cross-section of a massive tree. Afgarn recognized the book he was reading as the journal AJ stole from Hosto. Wither looked up from scribbling in a journal of his own as the doors opened. He munched on the end of a pipe he was smoking, this one in the shape of an upraised fanged maw. Doc! Ah! Wonderful to see you vertical once more. I was beginning to think you'd remain interred to your rustic vacation in the yard for eternity. We need to talk. Indeed, old boy. Being the man of action you are, I'm surprised at the length of your absence. Never one to shy from confrontation. I suppose recent events have proven intimidating. Recent event? Amati stood a floor above, a book open in her good hand. Oh, go oil your blade, why don't you? She's not given me one moment's peace, even standing guard outside my sister's bedroom when I'm looking after her. Was such an evil present. Oh, shut it and leave me be. Doc! Fine, fine. Surely a rousing revolution, explosions, a grim standoff ending in a mysterious happenstance is more than just one event of interest. The last one. Talk about the last one. I agree. Aleda entered, arm in a sling, leaning on Harden with Sully in tow. Wither's been dodging me for days, locked in that room with his sister. Now that the two of you see fit to grace the rest of us with your presence, I think it's time for some answers. Calling it a mysterious happenstance is like calling a spear to the gut a minor splinter. Hey, boss. Sully gave Gafgarn a pat on the shoulder, fresh bandages around her head. Healing. Things still get fuzzy if I move too fast. Almost fell down getting out of bed. Should you be out of bed? I'll be fine. About time we do something around here, right? Doran? Sleeping. Might keep his leg. That's something. Gafgarn pointed a mighty finger at the spindly professor. We made a deal. That you would help me in return for finding your sister. You never said she was some sort of monster. The group made to find seats at the table but stopped short as Wither slammed his hands on the table and shot out of his seat. Now see here, slanderous oaf! However dangerous you think you are, speak ill of my sister once more, and not only is our contract nullified, I'll see to it you're confined to your belligerent boots for all eternity. Tell us what happened. Wither's demeanor softened. 
almost as if answering the question were painful. I'm not rightly sure, old boy. You knew what you were bringing us into. You knew what she was capable of. But you gave us no warning. We deserve more than prevarication. As much as I disdain the position of ignorance, I must admit it in this case. I truly know very little about her mysterious malady. All I know is what's observable. The darkness erupts from her when her life is threatened. And after she is left drained but unhurt, those unfortunate enough to be in her proximity, however, are ripped asunder or missing altogether. At Ursula's, there was a liquid around her, a, a slime. It was near some of the dead as well. On my busted shield, my broken arm. What of that? Yes, I saw it too. Something viscous and vile. Quite the mystery within the mystery. I've studied it. Maybe a mucus of some kind. Similar to that which covers frogs. Or is emitted from certain denizens of the ocean deep. Evidence of whatever's in the darkness, I suppose. And the girl? What does she know? Alice knows nothing. Not the origins of the darkness, not what lies within. And she never remembers what happens upon its summoning. Like us, there remains only nightmares and visions. And this happened before, of course. Rither sunk into his chair, rubbing his brow. She was young. The first time it happened, she was thrown from a horse. The animal fled from us, turned a bend in the trail. We heard her scream and then silence. It was a mere moment before we found her, unconscious on the earth with that ichor surrounding. A stallion, a lumpy puddle. My parents were careful to keep her on the property after that. Once bandits attempted to rob us, taking a blade to her throat, it was the same. But father came out of that one missing a leg. From then on, confined to a wheelchair. Uh, what? Simple invention. Doran may need it, but never mind. Alice was restricted to the East Wing thereafter, a prisoner with no knowledge of her crime, until mother and father died. She, the darkness killed them? Withers' eyes looked downward, then he straightened up and puffed his pipe. No, natural causes. Since then, I've looked after her, an endeavor I have no plans of quitting. A fine job you did, since AJ just swooped in and kidnapped her. Mm, yes, says the observant warrior woman, who gouged her own eye out at said kidnapper's behest. So, we are without answers? A source for this evil? I have nothing else for you, my dear. I'd like to talk to her myself. As would I. Now see here. While she remains in my care, none of you shall cause her any degree of distress. She knows nothing else and fears it herself more than any of you ever will. That's hard to believe. It's been days. Yet I believe I still have bits of darkness knotted in my hair. Leave my sister in peace or leave. You're in no danger as long as you pose none yourself. It was as if we were submerged in the lake of Morodai itself. For such an evil to exist. Whether you're Morodai or the Void, you will give my sister peace. Peace may be exactly what she needs. It may be what the world needs, scholar. If by peace you mean death, you're sorely mistaken. Have you heard nothing? Are you blind as well as crippled? Her power saves her as surely as it dooms us. Don't you have your own people to deal with? The plight of the Benai Fondois seems so small in comparison to this madness. I've revealed all I can. My demand remains. My promise remains as well, old boy. Now, a topic at hand might yield some real answers. Your man, Rodney, tells us you're no exiled ruler. That you might return to your new throne at any time. Yeah, sounds like something I said. Boss, I'm confused about that one, too. No. Everything considered, I think I'm owed an answer. All my life, I just let people tell me what to do. The church, smidgen, you. I've stormed a castle, helped start a revolution, and fell into some dark pit for you. The least you can do is be straight with us. Everyone in the room turned to regard her with quizzical looks. The sound of creaking chairs and adjusting bodies filled the sudden emptiness. Wow, okay, Gaff's girl's got some spunk. I'm taller than you, Aleda, and I'm a grown woman. Could have fooled me. I've got a sharp eye, and I haven't found any evidence of that. I've got something you can detect right here, Hawk. Stop! Gafgarn growled, placing himself between Aleda's sneer and Sully's reddened grimace. I like the fire, but not now. <sighs> I exiled myself because a leader can't rule if he can't take his own throne. Wrong. You've proven yourself to all of your people, all through traditional rights, spilling the least blood possible. 
We'd follow you throne or no. Him not spilling blood? This is ridiculous. We saw people torn to pieces, and I don't know by what, and you were concerned about a chair. To be fair, it's a very nice chair. Gafgarn made it himself. And I'll never be worthy of it until I lift this curse. I already told you, old friend. How can my people respect me if I'm stuck like this? Something tells me this is your fault. The boots, how did you come by those? No one put them on you, I assume. He stole them. Rogni! If it smells like bear crap, squishes like bear crap. You get the clans to unite under you, and you celebrate by stealing some boots? No! It was a good old raid. There was a clan that wasn't interested. Ancient one, deepened in the harshest, coldest part of the mountains. Arngur, a stronghold standing since before the Imperium. Stonehearts. We're never much for socializing. The chieftain wouldn't accept Gafgarn's challenge. No meeting either. So? Raid. A challenge? Yes. It's customary that clans and warbands follow a particular diplomatic protocol. Differences may be settled by negotiation in a longhouse or hold. If not, then a chieftain might extend a challenge of prowess. A duel between leaders to settle matters. Should the challenge be denied, warbands assemble for brazen battle. Oh, we do something like that in the kingdoms, don't we? Ha! Ah, you mean your king's choosing of a champion? What chieftain in the right mind would accept a challenge like that? It's a sham. So you attacked these people? Hell yes! Did you need to? If I heard right, you already united your people. You'd think, right? I tried telling them the same thing. Gafgarn wouldn't have it. I need all my people. The Stonehearts were secluded, feared, revered. Having them under the one banner, I said I wouldn't stop until all of our people were one. You could have let them be and you know it. Taking them on was to prove something and little else. So, it was pride then. Familiar with that, aren't you? Enough. The raid was successful and we claimed our plunder. I found the boots guarded by their shaman. She warned me it was a relic of a dark past, hidden by the stone hearts for a millennia. I took them. Exiling myself was the only thing to do, to earn back their respect. Prowess is respect, Gafgarn. You've proven yourself to us over and over. It's strange, I'll give you that. But your little problem is just that. A little problem. No more. I explained. Nothing changes. You don't like it? None of you have to be here. Doc, how are you going to help me? By using the gifts our villain left for you. I would have begun work in earnest if you hadn't hoarded said treasures in your backyard campground. Still there, I presume. The gauntlets? AJ says he's playing a game. A game for which we don't know the rules. His gift will educate us, it seems. It has to be a waste of time. Something to distract us or draw us into another trap. Better we hunt him down and end it. Where would you consider we start? And in this condition? Sad to say. We play AJ's game. Investigate the journal. There must be leads to Gafgarn's respite. There's a young lady blacksmith who followed us here that may be of assistance. As for the gauntlets, I say put them on. The night previous, while Gafgarn wrestled his nightmares, a pleasant fire crackled in the fireplace within a distant cabin. A plush fur rug lay before it, pillows strewn about its soft hairs. Comfortably prostrate among them lay Ursula, the firelight dancing in her unflinching eyes. A man kneeled next to her, wrapping new bandages around the stump remaining of her leg. The salve he applied helped with the pain, but the process and the warm fire transported her back to that night, when she was dragged away from her estate to watch it explode from outside. A cauterization of her leg, the taste of the piece of wood in her mouth she bit down on. Pain was fleeting. Her hate and anger surged in her more permanently. The kneeling man finished and left the room, leaving her with the man sitting in the chair by the fire. His fresh bandages wound around his face, covering an eye. He scratched at the place, his body heaving with the loss. You've still got the other added. If the hawk can handle it, so can you. I don't know how she does it. How do you last in a fight without peripheral vision? You learn. Adapt. No different than before. Ursula began lifting herself from the floor, 
her body trembling with the effort. Madam, you heard the healer. You need to rest. Beaver still got you. You ain't going anywhere. Of all that pierces the void, why are you still here? The business and the gang are dead. This safe house is all I've got now. What's your deal? Might be right. I'm working awful hard for a sliced up, burnt side of meat. But why did you treat your girl so well? You're a fool. Clean, safe assets that trust you are better than raggedy dolls looking for a way out. No, that ain't it. You were tough on us. Made sense since we had the business of beating and money collecting. Can't have the soft heart of doing your dirty work. The girls, though, you were soft on them. Breaks when they needed, days off, comfort. You were hard, but more like they were your daughters than your assets. <coughs> What's your point? You're as hard as they come, madam. You loved your girls. Why? Wow. Didn't know any of my strong arms knew the word. And? I was just like them when I was barely a lady. Worked for some vicious bastards, too. Customers weren't any better. Always overworked. Always a day away from starving. Always waiting for the next fist when someone thought you weren't bringing enough in. Eh. Hard to see you as anything other than the boss. No one gets anywhere worth talking about without a good bit of suffering. So I grew hard over time. Until one night, I crept into those bastards' beds and slit their throats myself. Hmm. Rumor was your late husband rescued you. <laughs> that moron didn't lift a finger. He helped. Though, the knife was his. Stole it from him that same night. Smidgen was one of your regulars? Regulars? Too regular. Fool was sweet on me for months. When he saw I had the nerve to steal the business, he only got sweeter. Gang got bigger from there. And the girls? No one would treat my girls like that. Not ever. Fear I reserve for my soldiers and my enemies. A thought suffering got people somewhere. Their suffering brought them to me, just as yours did, sure enough. There's more of that on its way, I'm sure. So answer me. Why are you still here? Hard to see you as anything other than the boss. Angie tossed the contents of her stomach as she came back to wherever she was. Her blurry sight slowly cleared to reveal her hands <laughs> resting on a dusty rug, soaking with her vomit. <coughs> Bile dripped from her mouth into the vile puddle. A sour liquid splattered on her hands. There was something else, though. Something she saw that alarmed her, but she couldn't quite figure out why. She shifted her weight back and discovered her knees. There was something odd there, too. Something so familiar but her mind swam like a leaf in a river. She looked at her clothes, leather. She recognized that, but the other thing was there too. It wasn't until she looked around that she realized what it was. She was covered in blood. It came to her like a memory, a fragment of knowledge somehow lost. She made the connection when she saw the bodies around her, the same liquid strewn about rubble and destruction. Some sort of black ichor, stuck to her as well. But she had no word for it. Some of it stained the largest pile of rubble nearby in the middle of whatever room she was in. Her hand stretched across the ground next to her, a creature looking for a home. It wrapped around something light and round in her hand. She brought it up to her eyes. She knew this too. She used it to kill someone recently. Someone important. Her bow. But it was broken. One of its arms snapped and the string torn. Banji dropped it as she got to her feet. Hello? Who was she calling for? She didn't know. She walked around the ruined room, a strange feeling welling up inside her, a pain in her belly, but she couldn't remember the word for it. Her eyes found the empty space where a balcony once was. Someone had been there. The handle of a whip stuck out from under a beam. It elicited a feeling. 
hot and intense in her breast. What was that? Suddenly, the only thing that could assuage it was more blood. But it wasn't as intense as the first feeling. Now creeping into the rest of her body from her stomach, dull but unavoidable. One slow step at a time, she made her way outside, words coming back to her at each footfall. Each word, like an incomplete vision, only begged more questions. Oh, wait. Where... Where is this house? Moon. It's... It's... It's night? What... Which... Which night? Cool air caressed her face as she walked in the garden. Even with the dim moonlight filtered behind streaking clouds, Banji could make out burned flower bushes and planters filled with ash. A rat cut across her path to feed on a nearby corpse in leathers much like her own. Did she know these people once? She followed her feet to the ruined gate and ducked through it into a street empty but for random debris. A torn banner fluttered nearby. That, a fox, and, and what, a spear, I, I know this, like, like a wolf, a wolf. Stop right there. At first, the sentence rung hollow in her head, far off and without meaning. Her feet ceased moving as she tried to make sense of it. There? But where is there? Where is here? I, I, I remember that there is so much there, out there. This, this is nowhere. A man moved in front of her, torch in hand. The firelight glinted off of his breastplate, making the two lions emblazoned their appearance to dance together. The lions reminded her of something recent, and another feeling struck her rigid. It wasn't like the last feeling hot where this was cold. It wasn't like the first, which now ate at her edges and the pit of her belly and caused her mind to whirl. This one made her want to scream. Terror in the dark. Another loon. When we left a fight for that void forsaken tower, I wouldn't have guessed we'd come back to a dead king in this pit stain nonsense. She came from the house. She's covered in blood. I'm a shul. Look at her. Calm down. Lass, you best explain yourself. City has army enforced curfew by order of the Duke. Only thugs and rebels are stupid enough to be out after nightfall. Which, which night is this? What do you mean? Wait, look at her hand. Woman, let go of the knife. Banji noticed her hand grip the hilt of a knife on her belt so tight it hurt. The cold, halting feeling subsided, the hot one taking hold. Anger, she remembered. That's what it was. But why was she angry? Who did the whip belong to? She was important. Vanjie knew. That other feeling, such pain, gnawing at her, making her head pound. What was that? She had to stop it. The second man unsheathed his sword while the first held his torch aloft, a hand on his blade hilt. Vanjie's voice found a growl, leaving its whisper behind. Where is the wolf? Oh, isn't that the question of the week? Hand off the weapon. You're coming along alive or dead, freak. Not to me. Stop the wolf. The things from the dark will come. Last time. Hand off the knife or I'll cut you down right here. Soon. Here will be there. The soldier swung his blade, but Banji ducked under. She snapped back up into the man, finding an opening in his armor under his arm, plunging her knife into his rib cage. As the man stumbled aside, she dove for the other, cleaving his wrist where he held the torch. She grabbed his other hand and shoved it back, causing him to sheath his half-drawn sword. In a flash, her knife was away and her hand gripping the man's throat. The other man managed a gurgling cough from the ground. I remember this feeling now. It's hunger. She ripped his helmet off and tossed him to the ground. Before she understood what she was doing, she was on him. Her teeth sunk into something meaty. His throat, she remembered. 
What filled her mouth, she already knew, his blood. And that first feeling, the gnawing, blinding pain subsided. A new feeling replaced it, and with it, more memories. She looked back at the gurgling man on the floor, his eyes wide as he scrambled to crawl backwards. Vanji smiled, blood smearing her jaws, and demanded, Point me to the dear old duke. What plans to rock the world do Ursula and Vanji have now? Where is AJ and what's he doing? Will Gafgarn put on the gauntlets and see how they interact with the boots? Here's your cast. Narrator, Gafgarn, Wither, Harden, and guard number one. We're a voice acted by the man of a thousand voices, Mr. Michael Bethel. Imadi is Deborah Cristobal. Elada is Madalena Fossetti. Sully is voice acted by Caitlin Curtis. Rodney, Radid, and guard number two are Daniel French. Music, production, and sound design are by Daniel French at Fishbonius Sound Design. Thank you for continuing to travel the spectral streams on the Chronosphere. Stay tuned to Chronosphere Fiction for a lot more. Until next time, keep your cosmos clean. like thrillers, action, adventure, mystery, crime drama, well, you're in luck, because here on the Mutual Audio Network, we have Thursday Thrillers. You can subscribe and have a dose of adrenaline-pumping audio every Thursday from your favorite podcast player. Get it here now. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.